So thank you very much for coming. I'll start just by telling you what I do. I do a few things. <clears throat> and then I'm going to ask what you want me to talk about. Get to know the audience a little bit. And I'll try to weave the content of tonight's talk into really what you're looking for. But uh, absolutely right, I, I do sort of three or four things. I am the founder and CEO of Dolmer Impact Fund. Um, it's a private equity fund, uh, international private equity fund dedicated to Nepal. I'll talk a little bit about it. Um, uh, we invest, uh, we are a $37 million fund. Um, we're one of only two funds dedicated to Nepal, the other being BO2, run by my friend Sid Pandey. Um, and we invest across sectors, and I'm sure we'll be talking about those sectors uh, later on. Uh, our investors are mostly European banks or investors, uh, a lot of them development finance institutions who specialize in riskier countries and bringing capital into riskier countries, um, as well as private sector um, family offices, high net worth individuals, etc. And we've been investing now for about four years uh, with a great degree of success. In fact, uh, our investors have just uh, approved more funds for us, which I think is a great validation for both our work and for the Nepal business community. But I do other things as well. Um, as Ayush mentioned, I am the chairman and founder of Dolma Foundation, which predates very much, uh, was started 15 years ago, predates the Dolma Impact Fund. And he's right, I did come to Nepal 15 years ago and fall in love with the country, but I also fell in love with a woman <laughs> uh, who I married a couple of years later and three children later, we are living in Sanipa uh, and the UK, uh, sort of between the two um, with our three lovely children. And of all the things I do, of course, the role of husband and father is by far the most important. Uh, about five years ago, Dolma Foundation is a British charity. It's a non-profit. It does do some investments. We have the Dolma Ecotourism Program, which is um, uh, kind of sustainable impact investment, but really not to make money, um, although it, it does seem to, but that goes back into the charity. But we also sponsor a lot of children. We've rebuilt uh, a village after the earthquake and other things. Uh, finally, I have an academic role. I was honored to be admitted to the faculty of Nottingham University uh, five years ago. Um, I'm the honorary professor of sustainable business, uh, and I teach, um, I teach mostly least developed country investment. Um, I also teach about corruption, interesting subject, which I'm not gonna take many questions on. I did make a mistake the other day as I was about to give a lecture to one of the faculty members asked me, oh, what, what are you teaching on today? And I said, well, I'm, I'm teaching corruption. He <laughs> said, what? <laughs> so, I didn't mean I was particularly good at a practitioner of the subject. No, more on an institutional um, uh, and economic basis. And I also lecture at London Business School. Now, I'm gonna talk a bit about my journey um, to why I'm standing here on a stage in Kathmandu. Um, but before I do, I'd like to get to know the audience a little bit. The reason there is a whiteboard here is not because I'm a lecturer who has to have a whiteboard, is because I would like you to tell me the kind of topics you'd like me to cover. So why am I here? I think we all have individual journeys, um, and mine is no exception. I am British. Um, I want England to win the World Cup. <laughs> I, I don't think they will. Um, and uh, I'm a pretty normal British guy. Um, I traveled only to sort of France and Spain by the time I was 16, 17. Um, and I went to a grammar school. Grammar schools are the highly academic schools in the UK, but I didn't make the most of it. I um, passed my O-levels, SLC. Uh, but I left school as soon as you legally can in the UK at the age of 16. And I was a, I wanted to branch out. I couldn't handle the sort of institutional structure of the strict British grammar school. And so I took a train to London and got myself a job. Fortunately, I was a teenage computer programmer on pretty early Commodore 64. Not many people look old enough to remember those. 
computers. And I got myself a job at Deloitte. Um, first of all, cleaning the computer room, a computer room that was about this size of the stage with a computer with one megabyte of RAM. Um, and I would put these huge 12 platter disks into these machines that would spin round. I think they were 256 megabytes at the time. But this was the mainframe, effectively, of Deloitte, what became Deloitte, actually. Um, but I worked my way up, and it was a strange way to get into the financial sector, but I uh, became a systems operator, sort of network operator, and eventually programmer. And um, that got me into the corporate finance team at Deloitte, where in those days, people didn't know that much about technology. There weren't many consultancies. So I would be asked to do due diligence on M&A transactions, um, on the technology side, of course, on the computer systems of, um, of businesses. And that kind of got me into the world of, of finance. And I have to say, it's a great uh, training ground. When I was 23, I moved to New York to work at JP Morgan. Um, and was amazed there, the early days of the internet. Um, and we were involved in developing the first online portfolio management systems. So the first early Java, JavaScript, sort of stock tracking programs linked to JP Morgan's back end. And after three years at JP Morgan, I started my first business at the tender age of 25 and a bit. Um, and that was called Virtual Frontiers, and it was a software development company doing things like that for major um, financial and other big American companies. Um, I learned a lesson. Um, we were successful, I suppose, to the extent we grew a business. We sold a business. But before I, I... People kept coming to me. The first couple of years went great. Venture capital then came in, started to invest, buy up. There were roll-up strategies. And... Um, People kept approaching me to merge, to take investment. I just wanted organic growth. And, um, and we started a London office. But before I knew it, I looked around, and all my competitors were 10 times our size. They'd taken on venture capital. They'd roared towards growth in what was obviously a high-growth market. And frankly, we'd missed the boat. Now, we did sell successfully. But I don't think anything like the valuation. And I think that taught me something that I'll come back to when we talk about technology and what to think about, whether you're ready for investment and that sort of growth stage. Um, I had another business, uh, which I also managed to sell, also in software in the States, and then moved back to the UK to do a master's at London Business School. Um, then continued in my financial career, working for an investment bank in London, um, moved to Singapore, where I married my wife. She was working there uh, at the time for the Gurkhas, actually, for the Gurkha contingent. Um, and uh, we then, I rode out the, the, the wave of the sort of mid-2000s up to 2009 until crash. I was working, actually, for an American billionaire who immediately became a millionaire. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, yeah, they, they shut down. Or well, they stopped investing in Asia, at least, to pull their money back to repay some of the debts um, in the U.S. And so there I was in 2009, 10, wondering what to do. Um, it was a wonderful couple of years. It was a terrible couple of years. Um, I was not short of money. I am blessed in that regard. But... Um, but as a person who's jumped from job to job throughout his life, who's had opportunity after opportunity, the opportunities for a 40-year-old investment banker uh, were not great in 2009 or 10. Everybody was being sent out of the door and not in the door. So I had to sit for literally two years and figure out what I was going to do with my life. I wrote a fiction book. I did all sorts of things, which I found wonderful. I also suffered terribly from uncertainty. You know, what am I going to do? I went for a job with a company called Acumen. Um, it's an impact investment fund. I don't know if anyone American-based. It takes donors' money, mostly. Um, but it has this model of linking social and environmental good to private sector investment. I had a great deal of respect, and suddenly the job of chief investment officer came up, which I went through a few rounds of, and I didn't get. But that introduced me to the concept of 
impact investment. And suddenly the light came on. And that light was, I've been running this charity in Nepal for, at that time, 10 years. I clearly love humanity. I would like to see progress, however we think that's defined, certainly prosperity, um, grow more evenly throughout the world. And I've seen many aid projects, some of them successful, some of them not. But that private sector mechanism, that invisible hand, that allows people to pull themselves up was really, really fascinating. The light went on. Why don't I start an investment fund in a poor country that I already know extremely well? So I did. So I went back to my friends in the city of London, the old investors in previous investment banks, and I said, guys, I've got an idea. I'm starting an investment fund, private equity fund, for Nepal. And they laughed. They laughed. And I said, no, 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 I, I'm not joking. They said, what are you talking about? Like, it's Nepal? Like, you know, we've only just started investing in France. Like, I don't know about, I don't know about Nepal. So I re quickly realized the city of London and its financial institutions were probably not the best place to go. But it's amazing the depth and breadth of the investment landscape. And if you are dedicated, how you can find money. I am, of course, an entrepreneur myself. This is my business. Um, and so I met up with uh, high net worth individuals who believed in what I was doing about this private sector mechanism for broad-based prosperity. Um, I also met the development finance institution community. Um, banks like FMO, FinFund, Austrian Development Bank, Dutch Good Growth Fund, our investors, um, banks and, and funds. And I managed to pull together a fund which was then 20 million, is now 30, 37. Um, and I have to say, when that moment comes, when you realize uh, what you're going to do, it doesn't matter what gets in the way. Um, that's what I was going to do. It sounded crazy, uh, and it probably was. But I think all of us have this sort of, half of our head has a, a spreadsheet in it, calculating probabilities and risks. And the other half just has a belief, a kind of love if you like, and it is very similar to love. How do you fall in love? I don't know. How do you come up with this idea? I, I don't know, it just happens. It's not logical. And I think that's in all of us. And some of you may have had that moment, some of you may have not. But I think the trick of doing something which appears very difficult at the time, you've got to listen to that other voice. Don't listen too much to the spreadsheet. Because probability is probability. But actually, what's going to overcome the hurdles is that other voice, the voice that says, I, I, I'm simply going to do that. Um, and I think that sort of brings me on to you know, why I'm here. Um, and it brings me on to actually talking about raising money and the investment landscape um, and that kind of thing. And I think whether we're talking about technology or whether we're talking about any industry, what we're looking for as a private equity fund is people. You really only invest in one thing, and that's people. And what we're looking for is really two things. One is that side of the brain, that side that says, I am so dedicated to this goal, I want to build my business and grow it. Because the reason is that every business, not just in Nepal, but everywhere, is extremely difficult to grow and build. And without that kind of illogical determination, it's very likely they're not gonna get there. So what I'm really looking for first is an absolute burning desire. Um, because especially in Nepal, as we all know, things are very difficult, um, which I will come on to, sir. Um, and I'm also looking for honesty disclosure. Um, and we know in Nepal when we do financial and legal due diligence, if we find a perfect set of books, we know there's something wrong, right? We're not looking for perfection or we'd never invest money. We are looking for people that where our capital and experience can meet that desire, together we can build a system where making sure that those things don't happen again and 
by giving up whatever potential gains were being got from, be from before, um, can really access international capital markets, Dolma and way beyond Dolma, um, to grow their business. You know, that's it. Technical skills, yes, that's important. Good degree, yes, that's important. Um, as you know, I didn't get a bachelor's degree. As I've just said, I left school at 16. I was the only person to go to London Business School that, as far as I know, without a bachelor's degree. Yeah, anything's possible. Anything's possible. So I didn't really care. I remember one of our companies we invested in, I got a long email from somebody that hated him, previous shareholder, and he said, this guy's terrible. You don't, uh, you don't want to invest in this guy's company because he hasn't got a degree. So what? He's got a good business. I like the guy. It had nothing to do with it. Of course, it helps. Um, so really, I think those are the two most important things. Now, I'm going to come on to some of the things that were asked. Um, we've had two questions, one about telecoms, one about uh, IT companies and getting prepared. Is Nepal ready? What are investors looking for? So let's take the kind of what we call TMT, technology, media, and communication space for a few minutes. Um, so first of all, I was in Mumbai uh, last week. And um, I, I'm going to Mumbai now because we've got to start thinking about selling our companies. That's what a private equity fund has to do. It doesn't just invest. One day it has to make money. And although we're probably a few years away from that because we'd like our businesses to grow, um, the most likely route other than hydro for the stock exchange, um, because the stock exchange is very difficult to float companies on, and I'm going to talk about that in the landscape question, um, we're probably going to sell abroad, most likely to India. So I'm really understanding the landscape in India. And I think what strikes me immensely is a country very culturally similar to Nepal, and with its infrastructure problems and also deep poverty and lots of things, but the growth in the middle class is absolutely phenomenal. The brains applied to especially technology was amazing. Um, there's a large fund manager like us, but much larger, called Avishkar, um, run by a friend of mine, Vineet Rai, who's always been an inspiration to me. And I met one of their new companies, which they've uh, founded called Tribe3, it, takes, uh, it does loan applications for SMEs. And the amount of artificial intelligence technology that he was talking about. Did you know that you could, there is an artificial intellig intelligence that could log into your phone and through your SMSs and phone call list tell how likely you are to repay that loan? It's incredible. It's one of many examples. The reason for that is the kind of examples given to me were... Um, that people that call their families more are more likely to repay their loan. They're grounded, they have something to lose. A young single man, a migrant perhaps, who doesn't call his family. You know, incredible, that was just one of many examples. But the depth and breadth of technology was absolutely, is absolutely stunning in India. Um, why is that? Before I come on to how to invest in a technology company, why is that? You know, 20 years ago, really, uh, India was pretty isolated as an economy. Um, yes, it had some good academic institutions, but we're talking about a tiny fraction of the population that can get into them. Why is it that the global wave of technology has found such a foothold in a country like India, a country just like Nepal, but bigger? Why? Because they opened up to capital, and capital opened them up to the skills that come with that capital. And suddenly, India are playing in a global space. They saw the opportunity. Obviously, the BPO wave. But this is no longer India back office. This is India very much front office. This is e-commerce companies. This is AI companies. This is entrepreneurs. It was absolutely incredible. So how can Nepal do that? I think a lot of the answers to this question are wrapped around the regulatory space. Um, and I'm saving that. Um, for a little bit. So I do want to focus in a bit on technology and telecoms companies, what we might be looking for where we think the landscape is there. Now, Nepal, obviously, a much smaller market and a lot further behind. So I'll use a live example. I think we recently uh, committed an investment to Sastadil. I'm sure most of you know that, the number two in the market. Um, and we certainly found 
those two things, honesty and disclosure, an absolute drive. Um, and I think to take the question, I think, how do we prepare for that? Also, how do you take a business plan to strategy? I mean, they started in 2011, um, when really very few people knew about e-commerce here anyway. Um, and I think people thought they were a little crazy, a little bit like I was laughed at in the city of London. And, um, but they kept at it because they were dedicated. And they thought that, especially out there, if they can get a foothold in Kathmandu, once they start pushing out, not only are they outside of Kathmandu, not only are they going to experience growth, but they're going to be able to give products and services, give, of course, sell products and services to people that don't have access to those products and services. Through um, SME agents, they're going to be able to give them a stock, a virtual stock room of 30,000 products or whatever it is they, they have. Um, and so what they're doing is now pushing out of Kathmandu and setting up five centers with our investment where people can come if they don't have smartphones, they can order, they can pick up if they live in remote villages. And this is not only giving people products and services, it's empowering local SMEs as well and giving access. You know, this is a pretty fundamental belief. I don't think successful business people start out with the view, I want to get rich. I don't think... I haven't ever met a successful business person whose goal that was. Okay? Did, did Bill Gates set out saying, I want to be the richest man in the world? Or did he think that a PC on every desk was going to make life more efficient, better? Did Mark Zuckerberg think, I want to be a billionaire? Or did he think, I think networking the world is going to be incredible? Now, I think that's it. And I think that's what Sasterdeal thought. Um, and it's certainly still what they think. So, you know, we've been really impressed. How did they get from business plan? Well, I think the early days of business plan, you've got to find your own money, the, the friends and family round. You've really got to prove a track record. Um, there's a lot of marketing involved, but there has to be substance behind that. Um, and of course, we can't invest in companies which are too small. We, could, we actually typically invest between two million and five million US dollars. So for Nepal, that's definitely a mid to upper range um, company. So, you know, they certainly grew and, um, and it's really track record, you know, have you created that dedication? It's less about the business plan, to be honest. The business plan, yes, I suppose what we want to see is professionalism. I'd also like to see your shoes shined if you come for an interview, right? I'm not I suppose I am comparing the two. Everything that you put forward is your brand, and so your business plan is your brand. How much do I believe your business plan? How much do I think that curve of revenue is going to get there? How much do I you know, believe your market studies? Well, I'll certainly take them into account. We'll do our own. But it's got to be professional. Um, but only in the same way as I would shine my shoes before going in into an interview. Okay, it's not the numbers I'm going to take to heart, and we'll certainly question them. But I think it's very important that that looks well thought through. But it's not the be-all and end-all, and it's nowhere near as important as the sense of honesty and disclosure and the sense of drive that have got them to create that plan. So there's no substitute for it other than this determination and hard work. Um, other kind of... Um, and strategy, same thing, you know, business plan to strategy. Uh, is there any difference? Um, I mean, strategy is more, for me, you know, a single goal. Um, and I want to start to broaden out now the sense of dedication. I've sort of talked as though these businesses were driven by one person. They're not, of course. They're driven by multiple people in the teams, management team, right down to the secretary and the cleaners. Um, and I think strategy, you know, rather than these sort of uniform steps of here's a market size and here's my market share and I've got this strategy and there's an arrow over there and, you know, I'm going in that direction. I don't want to put it down. It's important. It looks good. It shows that you've done your thinking. What's really important is finding a unifying vision which not only 
you, the founder or founders, but your entire team will want to follow. And I think one of the best examples I can give is my own team. Uh, any Dolma people in the audience? I know there are two, that's a leading question, but I wonder who else is here. Um, there's a couple of people up the back there, but um, I have been very fortunate. Um, a lot of people who have moved back from living abroad, having got their degrees and, um, and uh, experience abroad, um, came back to Nepal. Um, they certainly earn less money in salary terms than they were or could do in the US or UK. They will hopefully earn much more because of what's called carried interest in the private, sec in the private equity industry. In other words, profit share in the fund. Um, but I think we've had a vision. We're going to be the first private equity fund in Nepal. We're going to drive prosperity through market sector forces. Um, and it, it's, a very, it's only a team of 14 people. Um, and we have a very unified culture. We had an off-site event in Pokhara a few weeks ago for two days, really to discuss what we want out of life. Um, and how the business can help be a platform to fulfill those personal goals. And it's amazing what came out of that. You know, people want to be happy. People want to do something meaningful, really basic things. Um, and I think creating a strategy, or to me, vision, which sets a goal that people will bind to where at least short-term money, I do believe money is very important, the possibility of earning more money because you're taking a risk is essential. Um, and that comes from stock options or profit shares and things like that. But finding that vision first before you set strategy. Strategy then becomes the mechanism for reaching that vision. Um, and that's where you can start to get into more strategic and eventually operational planning. Um, but it's been an amazing experience working with a team that is really focused on the same thing. It's what they want. To them, this alignment between, uh, and to me certainly, when I come to the office, I'm just Tim Gosher. I'm the same Tim Gosher I am at home. You know, for many years I worked in a job, and I was a certain person, and then I came home and I was a slightly different person. And I think if we can find a company which aligns that vision, that's 30, right? Yeah, thank you. Um, which aligns that vision with our passion, with our professional goals, frankly, that's one of the paths to, to happiness. So that was the Sasta deal story. Um, technology, media, communications. Uh, Nepal, um, I think the wonderful thing here is the lack of competition. I think if you can come up with a product and service, um, I think what's really going to be the game changer, um, eSay will have pioneered, of course, the e-wallet, a great deal of respect for them. Um, online banking is becoming more and more popular. A cashless society, uh, we're a long way from that. In the UK, we are starting to seriously talk about that. You now pay with your mobile phone uh, just by tapping it at the checkout. Um, issues of cash, cash being hoarded, obviously on my academic side, cash uh, sometimes being used for corruption or money laundering, cash is not perfect. So to help really streamline that, the integration of uh, telecommunications and technology and financial businesses and the banking system is essential. So innovations around that. I think it's really good to look south to India um, not straight to Silicon Valley, but look at what India is doing around this. I'm not an expert, I have to say. I used to be a venture capitalist in London, but that was 12 years ago, so I'm not up on the latest technology. I do think artificial intelligence um, poses a remarkable opportunity, um, perhaps a remarkable threat. Um, I don't know if, did anybody see the IBM debate the other day? Project debate? Um, there were two debaters where the human debater gave complex arguments on economic and political issues and the IBM computer responded with access to millions and millions of academic and other journals, um, quickly scanned that content, put it into the context of the debate, answered, gave justifications. It was amazing. Seriously, watch it. Um, but of course, that gives the opportunity for... 
um, huge uh, leaps in efficiency. Um, it's interesting that one of our companies is benefiting from that and adding a lot of jobs in Nepal, Cloud Factory. Um, was our first technology investment here. Um, and they are creating work by having cloud workers work for artificial intelligence companies, mostly in the US. They're not doing the programming. They're formulating the data that goes into the algorithms for artificial intelligence. For example, self-driving cars require millions and millions of frames of photos to click on what the obstacles are in a particular road. That needs to be done. And what they've done through an amazing business model and is a great example of this vision which you then backfill strategy into is they want to create a million cloud workers in the developing world, Nepal being the first and by far the largest um, of those offices. Um, and instead of what would be the most low paid slightly depressing work if you went into a Silicon Valley office and sat there clicking on obstacles on the roadside at minimum wage. They pay three times the minimum wage to anyone that can speak English and use the internet. And they've created an incredible goal and platform for people to go on and have worked in a very professional example. So I think you know, these are just a couple of examples where AI can actually create many jobs. You often think about AI, everything's going to be robots, the robots are going to take over. Um, but I think AI can uh, create a lot of jobs, especially in a country like Nepal. Now, agriculture I will come on to, but I really want to talk about the uh, public sector landscape here. The first thing I would say is that I've known Nepal for many years before I started Dolmer Impact Fund. Um, I didn't have any illusions that this was going to be easy. Uh, I, would, I would say that my experience of investing in Nepal is pretty much what I expected, which is pretty, pretty difficult. Um, it's no worse, it's certainly no better. Um, and I think there's no point in coming in here, I often meet expats, especially for, well, I won't mention any uh, organizations, but oh, it's so difficult, oh, it's, uh, it's impossible, the regulations are impossible. Well, yeah, fine, but you're here. I mean, we, we, why, why did you come then? Um, and I think we've got to accept it is what it is. I also want to make another statement. Um, over the last 12 years, I obviously came here during the conflict, first in 2003, but over the last 12 years, Nepal's been through an incredible journey. Um, the achievement of, of national agreement through so many ethnic and political groups um, over that journey to come through an earthquake and a blockade and the constitution and the elections is, is kind of a binary event, right? That's either going to collapse and nothing happened. And I think towards the 9th, 10th, 11th, year of that process, there were a lot of people thinking, oh, we're just in permanent turmoil, this is never going to happen. But it's a binary event, it's one or zero, and guess what? It was one. You know, you did it. It's absolutely amazing. I was actually born in Northern Ireland, um, in the middle of their so-called troubles, the, the war. Um, and we've had a very similar uh, successful peace protest. Um, a peace, peace uh, uh, process. And um, now, I think uh, 22 years after the signing of the peace accord, the politicians are still bickering. In fact, there's no government in Northern Ireland at the moment. It's been taken over. But the war has stopped. Stability in the economy has been maintained. And the hatred has gone. And that allows a society to coalesce and to function in things like public and private sector. So right now, as I stand here, I thought, first of all, we'll start a fund. It's, it's the end of 2014. Great. Whoa. I've raised a fund. Earthquake. Great. <laughs> okay. So, you know, blockade. Bang, bang. You know, and the regulations and the other things that I did expect. I wasn't expecting the earthquake and the blockade. Um, I think I tell you what, I, I was here for the earthquake. I think um, I hear my dad talking about... Being a, as a child, my dad's no longer with us, sadly. But um, 
talking about being a child in the war and the, the feeling in London going down into the um, underground stations with the blitz going on, the German bombers. I kind of got an incredible bond with this country as though I didn't have already. It was an incredible experience. Uh, and probably just strengthened my determination um, ever more. But since then, of course, um, things have been a little calmer, and now here we are with a new government. Finally, we're at that moment, and now is the time to look at public sector reform. Um, and one of the many reasons, of course, that we haven't seen public sector reform is simply because there's been so much turnover in government. It's very hard. I've spent time with many ministers. Um, Abindra Raj Joshi, I, I went to London with. Um, we went to see the stock exchange. He was very keen on issuing sovereign bonds in the international markets and giving Nepal a credit rating, which could open Nepal up for serious institutional capital from the international financial markets. I think he was in office for nine months. Of course, you, there's no way you can possibly introduce that kind of thing. Now we have a government for five years, and so I'd like to address a couple of things which could make a disproportionate difference to Nepal and its prosperity. Um, there is a long list of stuff. If you read a World Bank report on what Nepal should reform, you know, there are ministers getting these big things bang on their desk and the dust flies up and it's, you know, how to create perfection. Forget perfection. There is no perfection. There's no perfection in Singapore. There's no perfection in the UK. Um, what are the things which could really open up in a more systematic way? Well, the first thing is, I think, stop thinking about regulating because there's nothing to regulate. And this is an important point. Um, Dipesh Vaidya from Criti Capital and I were at a meeting with uh, a joint, one of the new joint secretaries in the Ministry of Finance, and I really appreciated their intent and their honesty. It was to learn about what the, private sec what the private equity and venture capital industry was. Uh, it was mentioned in the budget uh, speech, and they were asked to grow and create and help the private sector, the private equity and venture capital industry. Because obviously our industry creates in risk capital. They're going to take risk before debt, um, and they're going to help growth. Still more than 50% of India's foreign direct investment is private equity and venture capital. So it's a critical growth, and I think the finance minister got that absolutely right. And it was fascinating, and I don't mean to put anybody down by this because the questions were asked in the absolutely right way, but a very common public sector question is, so how do we, how do we regulate so that this private equity money isn't misused? To which my honest answer is, what, what private equity money? It's me and Sid Pandey. That's it. Um, and, you know, really, people may think we're a big fund, but we're tiny, tiny in the sort of international sphere of, of international fund management. Um, and I, I sort of, my advice was to uh, define and exempt, not define and regulate. Not yet. It's too early. Okay, we've got two players in the market. What you need to do is define. So first of all, if you take private equity and venture capital, what is it? It is perhaps you don't want to make that too broad on day one. You might be worried about money laundering. You might only want, uh, for example, an example might be funds with more than 50% owned by uh, in financial institutions with a balance sheet above X, something. So you're not wide open to any, any person just setting up a private equity fund and coming in with the money. So you can define reasonably narrowly for exactly the type of money that you want. But instead of regulating, in the draft there are suggestions like you should pay the management, the fund should pay the fund manager of 2% a year. It's nothing to do with the government, that's really to do with the fund manager and the, the investors of the fund. And lots of things like, like that. But really, I think my suggestion was to exempt. So what are the difficulties facing private equity? What would bring money in so that there is money to regulate? Yeah, what would bring money in? The obvious thing is tax breaks. I'm certainly not suggesting that, but that's a common um, theme used for any uh, regulation. 
What are the difficulties we face? Bureaucratic bottlenecks, that's the biggest thing. It's not tax breaks I want, it's to be able to do things. It's to be able to get things done quickly. It's to be able to get money in the country quickly. To be able to get money out of the country. I'd like guarantees on that sort of thing. Um, and I'm gonna talk about a couple of bottlenecks in the economy which could be the kind of exemptions. Because when you don't have a market to regulate and you apply regulation, all you're doing is reducing the potential of that market. Every time you say the fee to the fund manager will be 2% a year, anybody that wants to pay a fee of 25 or 1.5% doesn't come in. So wh why would you set a regulation like that? Um, I think to let the kind of money that you want in and provide incentives to do that, that would be wonderful. This is how the Industrial Promotion Board in Sri Lanka, sorry, the Department of Industry in Sri Lanka works. Instead of being a bottleneck, instead of having to get 10 signatures and shuffling files from desks, you can either send your money straight into Sri Lanka or you can go and register with the Department of Industry and they will give you tax breaks and they'll help you buy land and they'll help you get your business started up. I think that's what I'm talking about and that's not specifically about private equity or any particular area, it's for the entire public sector. How do we get things moving easier? How do we define and exempt before we come up with new regulations. Things will go wrong. Private equity will come. Some will be misused. I'm afraid that's a fact of life. But until you've experienced it yourself in a country, it's really hard to know what the right regulations are to, to control that. So what do I think of the major bottlenecks? Um, I think there are two. I think there are two. I think if there were two changes to regulation, I think we would see a flood of, relative flood, of foreign direct investment um, and startups. Um, and those two things are FDI, automatic route, and stock market reform. And I'm going to say why. Obviously, we're a foreign investor, so for every investment, we need to go to the Department of Industry then they will need a letter of no objection. If it's hydro, for example, we would go to the Department of Energy. Then it would come back to the Department of Industry. And then if it's above 20 million, which certainly one of ours was, goes to the Industrial Promotion Board, which didn't meet for eight months. Um, and if we get Industrial Promotion Board, it goes back to the Department of Industry, gets a few more stamps and signatures. Then it moves to the Central Bank. And then it goes through the entire process again with everybody reading every document and everything else until you get both governors and finally the governor's signature. And that particular hydro project with Sanima took seven months. Now what am I actually getting here? I'm getting a license to wire money into one of the poorest countries in the world, in South Asia, to build hydropower in a country that's starved of power. This was before Kulman Gising came in. I'm actually, all I'm doing is, can I send, my, I've got a deal. In order to apply at the beginning of this process, I have to have done due diligence. I've done a shareholders agreement. I've done all the legal agreements. I've, I'm prepared to take the risk. All I want to do is send money into the country. Seven months. And that's pretty good, by the way. That's not, but sometimes we've done two and a half months. But I see people wandering the corridors of the Department of Industry and the Central Bank for, I've heard, 13 months to get such a license. Now, you know, why would that be? I think uh, Nepal needs to copy India. Many years ago, it started something called an automatic route. The central bank does have a very valid concern, and that's with money laundering. But there are ways to stop money laundering without stopping the money coming in. What India does is they allow the money to come in. 45, thank you. Allows the money to come in. Uh, and it's held for 30 days while the central bank check the source of money. If you don't hear from the central bank, your money goes through. If you hear from them, they still have the right to kick it out. But the point is they get the money. Now, I saw, read in the newspaper yesterday that by far the biggest FDI pledges are from China, and that's great. It's great to have pledges, and these were figures from the Department of Industry. Now, a couple of years ago, I... I asked both the Department of Industry and the NRB to give me their figures for the year, and the Department of Industry's figures were something like 550 million people had pledged, 
applied to the Department of Industry. And that money, I think, $69 million came into the country in FDI. Somewhere along the way, 80, 90% of that money gave up. And that's really sad. And if you've got that kind of choking bottleneck to an economy, there are investors prepared to take the risk. My investors, I am an investor in Dolmer Impact Fund. I'm prepared to take the risk. The finance minister uh, suggested before the budget that the country needs $6 billion of capital investment per year to reach lower middle income status by 2030. And he's absolutely right. I don't disagree with the numbers. But about four billion of that needs to come from the public sector. And if we look at the depth of the debt and equity markets here, that's not going to come from the poll. It, you've got remittances, there's an issue. The growth has slowed, is it gonna dwindle? You've got the foreign currency issue. You've got a ballooning foreign exchange reserve as, of course, spending power increases from remittances and other activities. And because the productivity of the economy hasn't caught up with that, it's sucking in ever more imports from other countries, especially India. And if that carries on, it's going to be very hard for this country to hold the peg. How do you get productivity in an economy? In other words, how do you get the four billion or the difference between four billion and what can be provided from domestic markets? The, there's only one choice. There's not enough aid to provide three billion a year to Nepal, it has to come from FDI. And if you want FDI, that needs to open up. That doesn't mean opening the capital account. That doesn't mean depegging and floating the currency. It means just allowing people to send money into the country and being sure that they could get the money out. Okay, because every time an investor comes in and gives up, they're not coming back. That's the problem. Um, so that would be reform number one. Reform number two is the stock exchange, Sabon. Um, uh, incidentally, I've got to say that throughout my wanderings of corridors in government offices, I do rather enjoy myself. I mean, I'm interacting with people that generally mean well. Um, we've run workshops, we've done, you know, had a lot of interactions with them. Uh, frustrating, yes, the system is frustrating, but I often find the individuals very helpful. Um, I, I don't want to give, I don't want to give the wrong picture. Um, Sabon, I think under excellent management, um, and going in the right direction. But here are some of the things it's pretty common in most sort of nascent economies and market economies especially, is that um, pricing and lock-in. Um, so what I mean by pricing is that, uh, you know, you can, as long as you've got three years of profits and dividends and whatever the stipulations are, except for hydro, um, you can list at a premium. Uh, as long as it's not four time, more than four times book value. Now, is there any economists in the room? I know in here or so. You know, those who don't understand anything about valuation theory know that, well, first of all, book value is the least economic scientific of any valuation, and four times is completely arbitrary. Four times book value, if I was an airline that owned my aeroplanes, is pretty good. I'm pretty happy with four times book value. Does anybody know what Twitter's multiple of book value is today? I don't, by the way, but I assume it's in the hundreds, right? So I'm coming back to the technology question. Okay, arbitrary pricing. The issue in public sector about this draft that said management fund managers should get 2% from their fund. Four times book value is the maximum that you should issue at, or exit at, I can't remember. And I see this everywhere. Hydropower producers should get 17% return. By the way, I think that's about right. But it's complete coincidence that, that is actually what the market is probably asking for. You know, you need to let the market decide what the premium is going to be. It depends on what people are prepared to buy and sell at. It's as simple as that. And yes, there does have to need some regulation. There does need to be some regulation when selling to the public. But it's these sort of price fixes. Now, that isn't just preventing companies that would have more, more than four times book value from going to market. It's preventing people from starting those businesses. Because if you block, if you have a barrier to exit, you have created a barrier to entry, right? The exit risk is one of the biggest things we face in this country. One of the biggest things Dolmer Impact Fund faces. We've proven we can invest in great businesses. Is there anyone to buy them? Okay, maybe. If there was a stock market, and I hope we can list our hydro stocks, and the, the stock market actually works very well. 
um, for the stocks which are listed. Um, but because of these sort of price restrictions, technology companies, of course, would never. That's crazy. You know, we've got a couple of laptops and a hat stand. That's my assets. That's my book value. Um, but I've got, you know, a thousand percent growth a year. Obviously, I'm not going to sell at four times book value. I think the lesson here is if you block the exit, you block the entry. You'll stop people starting up. You'll stop not just the late stage capital at IPO, the mutual funds buying your stocks. You'll stop the growth stage private equity funds like us investing because we can't exit and we've got to give the money back to our shareholders one day. You'll stop the venture capitalists. You'll stop the one to watch, the, the you know, uh, in the sort of half a million dollar range coming in. You'll stop the angels. You'll stop people like Venture Talk and their incubators helping companies. And it's not just for technology, of course. It's for every other industry other than banking and financial, perhaps a couple of hotels and hydropower. The other thing on Siban is the lock-in period. And there is a lock-in period of three years. Um, and the problem with that, that's good for, sometimes that's used in other markets for promoters. You don't want the promoter to list his stock, sell it all, and run off into the sunset. That's quite, quite right. But for a financial investor, now, I think what's often not understood is most funds have a fixed end. They have a fixed life. You know, we will shut down in six years. By then, by the way, we plan to go to market for a Dolmer Impact Fund 2 and 3, so we will be here forever, um, as long as we invest in good businesses. But the fund itself will shut down in 10 years. We've got to sell that money. If the stock exchange adds three years, so we've effectively built a business good enough to IPO, and then we have to wait three years, that really brings us down to seven years, which means we really can't invest in those companies in the first place, which means we don't. So what I'm trying to get to here is capital is a supply chain from the first, from your mum and dad investing $100 to help you start up and buy your first, you know, whatever, to the mutual fund buying you a big chunk of your IPO book. If you block the exit, you block the entry, and you block the whole supply chain. Those two things, those two things, much shorter than a World Bank reform book to the Ministry of Finance, those two things would open up not just capital, but all the things that capital stimulates the ideas, the experts. We are appointing a guy called David Grigson, who is, was a director at Ocado and the CFO of Reuters. Ocado is the biggest, world's biggest online supermarket. He's going to be advisor to the board of Sasta Deal. Um, and we bring all sorts of other expert advice, and that's what's happened in India. That's why you see in India, because they opened up to capital. When they open up to capital, it kickstarts a systemic process of the supply chain of capital and all the ideas that come with that from abroad or from within. And it's that systemic power, the same power of markets bringing prosperity, that I think the government has an opportunity now with a five-year term, and I believe is very serious about, uh, about achieving. Um, and those are relatively easy reforms. I'm not a public sector expert, but this is what I see as an investor that would really make a massive difference. Now, I think I've probably got about 10 minutes, five minutes, and I had a question on agriculture. Um, we haven't announced this yet, but we are investing. We have already got approval for an investment in agriculture. Um, Again, a business model that we found in India um, is the combination of grain storage um, and the, the mandi. Probably saying that wrong, apologies. Um, creating a market. And the silo technology today um, could save, I think Nepal loses about 25 to 30 percent of its grain through poor storage. Okay, it's stored in a sack gets wet, gets dry, um, there's no um, conditioning and, and quality control of that storage. And so with that kind of loss, and the country certainly in rice going into net uh, import from net export, looking at that loss scenario from the inefficiency of the supply and storing of the grain in, the, of the, um, uh, grain in this case uh, is going to be very important. So we will be announcing shortly an investment in a business to build um, these silos, to create markets, 
to allow about 10,000 farmers to store their grain in quality control so that it doesn't matter which grain they take out, it doesn't have to be the same as they've put in. There's another really interesting innovation with Saksham, which I'm also probably pronouncing wrong, uh, is a, is a DFID funded program which has pioneered warehouse receipt financing, the ability for that farmer to um, actually get financing while his grain is stored. So as a farmer now, A, I have to pay a little bit of rent for the storage, but I'm not gonna lose 25% of my grain, so that increases my returns. More importantly, I don't have to sell at harvest time. So I can now wait until I think the prices are best. More importantly than that, I can come to the Mandy and I can trade my grain. I can trade a piece of paper, not the sack sitting under my stall. I can trade a piece of paper. And even more important than that, if I need money today, I can borrow money from a bank based on the collateral of that. Now, again, I'm not an agricultural expert. I do believe that what we're investing in has a huge market and profit, profit potential. I also think equally important is the opportunity for the farmers and therefore the consumers and the prices of grain in the market again throughout the, throughout the chain. So I think I've sort of covered most of the things that were asked of me. I've tried to weave together what um, the subjects from the few hands, we're gonna have a lot more hands after this. But I think I would wanna finish on on this note, um, I, I, this is the most amazing job, if I can call it a job, that I've ever had. And the reason for that is business is really just part of society. It's not a separate thing. To me, it operates under a charter from society with an agreement from society to operate a business and make profit. And if business ignores society, or the environment. It's just as important a stakeholder as the shareholder or the debt holder. So if we ignore it as the Bangladesh garment factory, BP in the Gulf of Mexico, millions and millions of examples, smaller examples where people think, I'll just save a bit of money now. Just save a bit of money now. Just get away with it, it'll be fine. Garment factory collapse, 1,300 people dead anybody that thinks that's a good idea now, obviously not. Um, I think what we've got to do is care about the uh, stakeholders of society and the environment. We also have to care about the stakeholders of the shareholders and the debt holders, because if we don't pay those guys back, we're not going to have a business. There's going to be no employees. There's going to be no benefit to society. And I think it's just where you put that emphasis. I am a great believer, and personally the way we do it at Dolmer Impact Fund is that we call ourselves a finance first impact fund. What that means is the first thing we do is we look at the business, we, we make sure we're not investing in an evil business. So if you came to me saying I've got a great idea for a gun factory using child labor, yeah, probably, probably wouldn't be interested. But actually, if you invest with good environmental and social governance in most businesses, you're probably going to lower emissions. You're probably going to employ more people. You're probably going to pay those people more than the minimum wage. You're probably going to give them a much better package. It's a sustainable job. It's pretty hard to do bad. In fact, if you have a successful business and you have good corporate and environmental and social governance in, in a country like this. And so I'm a firm believer to set financial and strategic targets um, for our companies, sit on their boards, help them get there, bring in the skills that can do that. We don't set KPIs which are, please employ this many people this year, or please have this ratio of hospital beds, we have a hospital investment to you know, doctors. Um, these are the outcomes of the invisible hand. These are the outcomes of the private sector. So what we do is we set sustainable financial targets. We agree with the promoters' sustainable financial targets, but we do track the outcomes. And there's some amazing outcomes. Four years in, less than four years in, we provide 3,000 jobs, sustainable, well-paid jobs with training in Nepal today through our seven portfolio companies. Um, that is set to grow. I don't know because we don't set targets. 10, 20,000 with this fund, fund number two, I don't know. 
carbon emissions. I won't go through all the numbers, but we set simple five or six target, five or six metrics that we track. And this is what I'm talking about, about Dolmer Impact Fund, the first private equity fund for Nepal, using market-based systems to truly sustainable, sustainably generate prosperity for one of the most important stakeholders in business, which is society, the people, the humans, it's you and me. With that, I'll stop, and uh, I think we're going to go into the next section. Is that about time? Great. Thank you very much. <laughs>